Hey everyone, Anarch here. Today I want to make a video which covers a topic that I think is both foundational to the project of this channel, but also oriented towards a subject that receives little attention or respect. Namely that philosophy underpins everything. So what do I mean by this? Well, first, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean you have to spend all your days delving into philosophical tomes and learning obscure theoretical jargon in order to be a good ally or a well-informed individual. But I also don't mean, by contrast, that you shouldn't acquaint yourself with those things. Let me explain. When people make decisions, when they have discussions, when they hold any beliefs or apply any practical technique to the world, they are implicitly making a set of philosophical assumptions about the universe which guide their actions. So when someone says something as simple as, I need to go to the store to buy bread, there are layers and layers of philosophical assumptions they're making. First of all, they are assuming they exist. They are assuming the store has continued to exist after they stopped thinking about it. They are assuming that their phenomenal experience of being a human with the need to eat is accurate. After all, they've never died from starvation, so upon what basis are they assuming they need bread? Also, when they go to the store, they will drive a car on roads with people they are assuming will obey ethical rules. That they will not be run off the road in an act of pure sociopathy. You see, to operate in the world, we must hold some set of ideas which, although not often inspected, form a foundation for how we build beliefs, how we correct internal and external falsehoods, and how we think the universe functions. This does not mean that everyone has chosen a set of consistent philosophical beliefs, mind you, nor ones that accord with the reality around us. In fact, as I will argue in this and coming videos, some of the worst sorts of political and ethical ideologies are the outcome of inconsistent or poorly inspected philosophical ideas. But it should be said, the vast majority of all ideas that are conveyed between people and held internally have been historically mapped out by philosophical thinkers, sometimes even those from ancient society. So why is this important? Because if philosophical ideas are the foundations that determine our actions, the control of philosophical ideas is the control of people. This is exemplified in the concept known as the Overton window. Although this was originally intended to talk about the acceptability of discourse on government intervention and personal freedom, it has been extended significantly since then to include all sorts of unspoken ideological constraints that society deems either acceptable or unacceptable to speak about. Noam Chomsky on this subject had the following to say, the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum, even encourage the more critical and dissident views. That gives people the sense that there's free thinking going on, while all the time the presuppositions of the system are being reinforced by the limits put on the range of the debate. For this reason, we cannot presume to undermine harmful ideas unless we actually understand the foundation of both our own ideologies and all of their implicit assumptions, as well as the ideologies of our opponents. Although, at first, there may be some headway that can be made by expressing opinions and beliefs, if a person truly wants to cling to those beliefs, they will quickly retreat further and further into their foundations, exposing more and more of those unspoken assumptions. And if we do not educate ourselves, we may very well end up at a dead end when this happens. Indeed, when the dead end is reached, many will throw up their hands and declare the person they are attempting to persuade is too lost to be saved. And although sometimes this may be the case and a person is too dug into their beliefs to ever concede, oftentimes this just results from the persuader not knowing the proper arguments to call their opponent's beliefs into question. These situations inevitably just lead to the two sides shouting opinions at each other. Yet. 
All manner of disciplines and ideologies have come to believe they are separate from this dynamic. Why? Well, we live in a world that is highly decontextualized. As we proceed from a young age through society, we are led to a series of ideas. These ideas are not framed as philosophical in nature. Instead, they are conveyed to us as unchanging facets of reality. Indeed, in the postmodernist realism of capitalism, the internal logic of capitalist markets has come to define every discourse. Francis Fukuyama, in his work, The End of History, argued that, in light of the fall of the Soviet Union and the slow dissolution of the Western Bloc, we had watched a solidification of liberal capitalist democracy that was the end extreme of all political and economic development. In Fukuyama's opinion, liberal capitalist democracy was the last societal paradigm that would ever exist. Physicist Albert Mickelson once said, The more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. And these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Our future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. I present both cases to you because both were particularly incorrect. In fact, they both preceded rapid shifts in their respective fields. Mickelson gave his statement in 1894, just before the revolutionary changes that would become special relativity, general relativity, and a century of groundbreaking discoveries in quantum physics. Fukuyama, well, his prediction was about the era we're currently living in. A statement that I hope to any of you watching with a similar 2020 hindsight will strike you with the utmost absurdity. But there is a commonality between these two cases. Both Fukuyama and Mickelson were making these statements in a time when the accumulation of legitimacy and power for the dominant paradigm had become nigh absolute. In both cases, the ideological boundaries had been so firmly set that they appeared literally immovable. So what happens when those assumed, decontextualized, ideological foundations come to produce undeniable contradictions? What happens when the received wisdom has produced a thoroughly unjust, unfulfilling, and alienating society? Well, in this scenario, the unjustly maligned, unfulfilled, and alienated masses must choose to either challenge the immovable suppositions or to cling to them desperately in hopes they will be rewarded in their steadfast orthodoxy. This is the underlying difference between the revolutionary and the reactionary. The revolutionary challenges the corrupt suppositions of society and, in doing so, challenges the orientation of power structures and shifts the Overton window. The reactionary doubles down on the corrupt suppositions, reinforcing and bolstering that power structure against threats outside of the Overton window. This is why, although fascism claims to be revolutionary, it always instead bolsters the power of capital. You cannot dismantle the logic of authoritarian institutes by embracing the ideology that might makes right, that there are inborn racial hierarchies, and that dominance-based meritocracy is an efficient way to organize society. These ideas are baked into the very system that already brought society to ruin. It is only by undermining these philosophical principles that true revolution takes place. And if those who wish to see progress do not take care to tend to these distinctions and to uproot the malignant ideologies that bolster unaccountable power structures, they will find themselves as pawns for the new unaccountable power structures that arise. With all of this in mind, if we seek to change society, we must plant the philosophical seeds that will grow into our ideology. If we do not, we cannot guarantee that the distressed masses will choose revolution over reaction. This process is not fast, it is not painless, and it requires significant mental labor. But it is not only a preferable outcome, it is necessary for the creation of a social revolution. After all, 
What will the masses struggle for if they cannot perceive its image upon the horizon? How can they justify ousting their old beliefs if you cannot give them a new set of suppositions to form the foundation? In the book, Anarchism and Workers' Self-Management in Revolutionary Spain, Frank Mintz interviews several syndicalists who were involved in the Spanish Revolution and asks them why anarchism had caught on so uniquely there. Here's his paraphrase of what all said unanimously. At the turn of the century, virtually all of the most highly regarded inspirational works of this school of thought, anarchism, were published in Spanish. A tide of translated pamphlets or originals from the pens of native-born militants pushed the libertarian message everywhere. The anarchist press reached into the furthest flung corners of Spain. Armies of agitators, spurred on by a burning sectarianism, toured the cities, towns, and villages preaching the good news. Respect for womanhood and equality of the sexes in the home and in society, love of nature and of learning. The Iberian anarchist greedily gobbled up and harnessed to his creed all social trends marked with the cachet of novelty. After a strike by Andalusian farm laborers in 1919, the masses were gripped by an ardent craving for knowledge as they had been in 1903. Reading was unrelenting by night in their farmsteads, by day in the plowed fields. During smoke breaks, the spectacle was always the same, some worker reading and the rest listening very attentively. A newspaper was the most welcomed gift that could be bestowed upon a working man who found himself at a loose end. Farm laborers carried some pamphlet or newspaper in their knapsacks along with their lunches. Any one of the trade unionist villages received hundreds of copies of the like-minded press, purchased even by those who could not read. We are meant to be the ally and advocate of the masses. If they are deprived, we must tend to their needs. If they are uneducated, we must educate them. And if that somehow seems overwhelming, know that it is because the work has been abandoned for so long that an uphill battle must now be waged. Defeatism, anti-intellectualism, nihilism, and cynicism will never produce a revolution of any worth. We must be the sowers of hope, the common person's philosopher that brings existential meaning and sincerity to their lives. After all, nothing that is truly immense comes into being that way. The tree does not burst from the ground fully formed. Its seeds must first be planted and nurtured to fruition before it may flourish. We are thus tasked as the patient gardeners who must plant and tend to the seeds of revolution. Do not shrug away the burden. We must engage earnestly with the philosophical foundations that are waging war in society if we are to be a bulwark to the reaction against progress, lest we reaffirm the apparently immovable fixtures. If you watched till the end, thanks. Score one for long attention spans in an era of distractions. If you'd like to support the work I'm doing here, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. As you can see, this channel is still really tiny and every single interaction makes a huge difference. Also, if you really like what I'm doing here, go become a patron at the Patreon link below. Anyway, see you around. Sincerity and solidarity, friends.